Hey, it's Mark here, and today I'm going to be counting down 12 fantastic affordable games. As a reminder, if you enjoy this, please subscribe and like it. And if you want to support The Thoughtful Gamer, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. These are 12 games that I love, each and every one of them. And I checked today, they are all in stock in stores right now for under $25 in America. And in fact, most of them are under $20. Uh, so let's get to 12 amazing, affordable games. Now, when you see this list, you're obviously thinking about party games, and there are indeed party games on my list. Let's start with the first one, and that is Codenames, or Codenames Duet, uh, which is the one I have here. I do own a copy of Codenames, but I don't know who has it. I think I let someone borrow it, and I haven't gotten it back yet. I'll probably just buy a new copy because it's quite cheap. It's a brilliant game. If there's any game you've heard of on this list, it's definitely Codenames, although there are many games on here that are pretty popular. Uh, but Codenames is a great word game. It's a great team game. It's great to bring out at parties. Uh, it's going to last a very, very long time. If there's any game of the last 10 years that's going to go down as a classic, I think it's Codenames. Uh, that's how good it is and uh, how popular it is. So Codings is the first one on my list. Let's move on to my second pick, which is another party game, not as widely known. Stay cool. This is a multitasking party game. In fact, I believe that is, that is indeed the subtitle of it. And for some reason, it didn't get a lot of sales, I think, in America. And I kind of know why, as a multitasking game, it is kind of stressful, but a lot of party games are kind of stressful. So I didn't think it would be a big deal to people. Uh, but if you don't mind stressful party games, party games about trying to do more than one thing at once, this one is fantastic. And the stress is hilarious. I mean, that's one of the great things about party games is that when they are stressful, it's funny because you're all being stressed and you're all panicking over completely trivial things. That's exactly what Stay Cool is about it is really, really good. Number three, another party game, this time a dexterity game, and my favorite dexterity game of the last few years, that is Catch the Moon. This is a stacking game done with little wooden ladders, and you create these elaborate structures uh, just trying to meet very simple criteria for placement. It's really, really actually a beautiful game. You think with the dexterity stacking game, not necessarily uh, something that looks great. It might look fun or it might look funny. This one actually looks kind of artistic when you're in the middle of playing, which I think is quite unique. It's really, really good. Um, and I, I mean, our group loves it. We pull it out all the time. Number four is a game, another game that I lent to someone and I don't know who has it, but I'll probably just buy another copy. And that is The Resistance. There are many, many games that have taken The Resistance and done other things with them. Secret Hitler comes to mind. I don't think any of them are as good as The Resistance. Now, obviously The Resistance comes from Werewolf, comes from Mafia originally, and I think it exceeds that game by leaps and bounds. Uh, by making it the deduction much more intricate, by not having player elimination. The Resistance is still amazing. So if you played it back in the day, it came out about 10 to 12 years ago, I think, and thought you were over it, try it again. It's still really, really, really good. Hands down, my favorite social deduction game. Number five is a game that I don't own because a friend owns it, but it's well worth having if you don't have a friend who has it, and that is Sushi Go Party. There's also the original Sushi Go. Both are extremely affordable. Party basically triples or quadruples the amount of content in the game just by adding variety, and it's not that much more expensive than the original Sushi Go, so definitely get the Sushi Go Party version. It is a very simple drafting game, uh, much like Seven Wonders, and it's about as simple as drafting gets, and that's what's great about it. It's extremely easy to teach to people, and uh, you can get through it pretty quickly, but you're also making very interesting decisions throughout. 
it's simple, but it's also very interactive because what other people draft is very important in Sushi Go, especially with some of the arrangements. It's a really good game. We're moving a little bit away from the party games here. Sushi Go Party has party in the title, kind of a Euro game. Uh, the Crew, my next pick, uh, is a big hit from the last couple of years. Uh, there are two versions. This is the first one. The second one, also well worth playing. Both very, very good. And this is a trick-taking game. So if you like hearts, if you like spades, uh, the crew is a cooperative trick-taking game. And by making it cooperative, Thomas Singh made trick-taking brand new to me. He took trick-taking something. I, I played hundreds of games of hearts, mostly on the computer. And I'd never really thought about trick-taking the way I did when I was playing the crew because it intensifies and focuses on the aspects, the strategic aspects of trick-taking that always exist but aren't as pointed as in this game. You have to keep track of who has which cards. You have to understand the implications of on that card count, of that uh, knowing the arrangement of what people have. It's really, really, really good. Both versions, well worth having. Uh, it's not a beginner's trick-taking game. A lot of people think that it's an introduction. It's a good introduction to trick-taking because it's cooperative. That's not true. The strategy is, I think, a little too intense. Start with something a little bit lighter. Uh, but once you understand the, this style and genre of game, the crew is one of the best we've ever seen. Next, another game I do not own because a friend does, and that is For Sale. This is a, an auction game and one of the best auction games of all time. It com is comprised of two different auctions, so you get uh, two at once, uh, and it's simply about bidding for property and then trying to sell that property for the highest price. It's clean. It's very easy to teach. It handles up to six players very well. Uh, just a really great like 15 to 20 minute game uh, that you can pull out at any time. I, it's a crowd pleaser. Everyone likes for sale. Number eight is Sprawlopolis, which I've got right here. This is from Button Shy. They do all their games in these little bifold wallets, uh, and they're all 18 card games or micro games. Sprawlopolis, to me, is by far the best micro game ever made. It is a cooperative game. You can play it easily solo. And it's about tile lane, except your tiles are cards. And each card has four different uh, images and a kind of city building thing. It also has roads that go through. And you're trying to arrange the cards by placing them down, overlapping them with other cards that are already on the board uh, to meet certain criteria that are randomly selected each game. It's a wonderful puzzle really good at, again, solo up to, I'd say, four to five players. I think technically it only handles four, but there's nothing really stopping you from going higher than that. Just a, a really perfect game. You can't get much better than that for 18 cards, and I believe it's only about $12. If you are by yourself, my favorite right now solo game that is solo only is Freedom and Freeze's Friday. This is a really nice deck builder game where you are playing it in kind of three to four phases towards the beginning of the game. You're facing encounters and you're strategically trying to lose encounters with wild creatures on this island. It's an island survival thing. You're trying to strategically lose so that you can trash cards out of your hand. And then at some point, you got to figure out when you're pivoting over to trying to win these encounters. Because when you win them, you get the card associated with them. And that card gets added to your deck. And you start building in your deck and growing it. And I think that pivot point really makes Friday a fascinating game. It takes Dominion's deck building pivot point, which is... When do I start diluting my deck in order to buy victory points and kind of flips it because you start with a garbage deck and you're trying to trash it down as much as possible before you build it back up and then you face a final boss, which is really cool. Uh, really, really nice solo game. I haven't yet found one that's better. There might be one that's going to compete with it, but it is definitely not as affordable. I'll review that one soon. Number 10 
is the game that my wife Amber requests to play all the time, Battle Line from Reiner Knizia. This is the medi medieval version, which I believe is the same exact thing as the original version, just different art. And this is a, what I call a column fighter game. I don't, there's no good name for this style. It's like this game or Lost Cities or Air, Land and Sea or Radlands kind of fits into that where you're, you and your opponent are lining up cards in these columns that are conflicting in some way. In Battle Line, you're trying to make three card poker hands in your columns. It's all about timing, about psychology, about trying to guess what your opponent has. It's surprisingly intense game for how simple it is, just basically cards and suits. In fact, you can almost create your own battle line at home with a deck of cards. Not quite, but almost. Uh, but it's very cheap, so just get your own version so you don't have to do that. A really brilliant game from the master, Rainer Knizia. Number 11 is the game with the funny box, Onitama. This is for people who like abstract games. It's a really nifty one. It's kind of like chess in that uh, you're trying to capture one particular piece. Uh, you can also win by going to the back row with a certain number of pieces, but usually you capture the main piece. The catch with Onitama is that the board is very small, and there are only a certain limited number of moves you can make. There are five selected randomly each game, like move patterns. So in other words, like a knight in chess can move... Uh, uh, a particular pattern, so one space and then two 90 degrees or, the, or vice versa. There are moves like that that are assigned at random, and at any given point in time, each player has access to two of them and one's in the middle. And then once you use a card to make the move that is with your piece that is on that card, you swap it for the one in the middle. So then you know in two turns your opponent will then have access to that move. It creates this little twisty mind game. Uh, that is really, really interesting. It has a cool aesthetic. I don't love the rectangular box. It's kind of awkward to fit in places, but I guess it's unique and stands out. Not too bad. Uh, but a really nice, clean, abstract game. Number 12, my final game is the most complicated, most intense of them all. And that is Innovation by Carl Chuddock. I've kind of bounced off some of his other games. I also own Matanai, uh, which I need to play more, but didn't love on first play. And in fact, with Innovation, I didn't love it on my first play, but I've grown to really, really like it. It is about advancing down the progress timeline of history, uh, starting with very simple tools and advancing into the modern era. But really what it's about is being able to tactically interpret and implement card effects that are all over the place. So we see lots of games now, like with Wingspan, Terraforming Mars, now Arc Nova, that I call giant deck games because they all have these giant decks of cards and all of them are unique. That's kind of what innovation is, except it's only the deck of cards. And there are multiple ways you can manipulate these cards and use them in the game, and it's all about trying to navigate that understanding of having information thrown at you all the time by gathering, drawing cards, putting them in front of you. There's a mechanism called splaying that gives you access to higher level stuff. It's about navigating that rules complexity, finding really cool, sometimes really powerful combinations and tricks, and then using that as a springboard to surpass your opponent. It takes a little bit to get used to, but once you get a really good game of innovation and in, you'll, you'll understand that it's really brilliant. Maybe every once in a while you get a dud game, but they're not too long, even as complex as they are. A completely unique game and one that I really love. So those are 12 great affordable games, all of them under $25, most of them under $20, and I checked they're all in stock. So if you're looking for a game, you don't want to spend tons of money, I 
wholly recommend any one of these. And I, in fact, I have reviewed many of them. All the ones that I have reviewed, I will put in the description. Thanks for watching. And again, if you'd like to support me, please subscribe, please like this video. And if you want to financially support me, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Thank you.